Good morning. Welcome to Victorious Faith. I'm Cherry Campbell. We're studying the lesson, Proofs That Abundance Is God's Will. Proofs That Abundance Is God's Will. And we're currently on proof number 21, The Blessing. And we've been talking about the blessing now for a couple weeks. And that if you've missed any of the programs, you can go to my website and my YouTube channel to listen to them online. You can go to my website at victoriousfaith.co, V-I-C-T-O-R-I-O-U-S, victorious like a champion, faith, F-A-I-T-H dot C-O, C-O like Colorado. And go to the Radio Broadcast Archives page. There you will see at the top the current series of teaching that we are doing. Click on the link. It will open up for you the page with the entire series on it. As far as the programs that we have currently uh, posted, that is where you can go to see and listen to the recent radio broadcasts if you've missed any of them. Now, we are studying the blessing and by definition, the blessing is the anointing or the power of God to multiply, be fruitful, and increase both numerically and financially, both numerically and financially. And we've been looking at for, um, let's say, the history of the blessing, how the blessing went from one generation to another generation. And we saw that Adam was given the blessing in Genesis 1, verse 28. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. God blessed. So they were blessed. Adam and Eve were blessed in Genesis 1, 28. Then in Genesis 3, they sinned. The, their sin reversed the blessing and turned it into the curse. So in Genesis 3, the curse came. Then we see later in Genesis 9, God gave the blessing to Noah. God gave the blessing to Noah in Genesis 9. Actually, it was to Noah and his sons in Genesis 9-1. God blessed Noah and his sons. But we see that not all three of Noah's sons, his sons were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And I am correcting, I had mispronounced Japheth. It is with the long A, Japheth. And Noah's three sons, not all three of them continued walking in the blessing. But Ham, the second son, was cursed. Because he looked on his father's nakedness when Noah was drunk. And so Ham was cursed and Ham's descendants were cursed. And in Genesis 9, 26, Noah said to Shem, blessed be the Lord God, uh, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. Now, Canaan was Ham's son. And verse 27, may God extend the territory of Japheth. And may Japheth live in the tents of Shem. And may Canaan be his slave. Notice that Japheth actually was to share in Shem's blessing. May Japheth. May Japheth live in the tents of Shem. In other words, may Japheth be blessed in Shem's blessing. So the blessing was directly given to to Shem by Noah. From father to son, Noah to Shem. And Ham was cursed and his descendants. Japheth would be blessed in the tents of Shem or you could say in the blessing of Shem. So Japheth would be blessed through Shem's blessing. But we see the blessing directly given father to son from Noah to Shem. And then we don't see the blessing mentioned again until you get to Genesis 12, 
where God comes to Abram in Genesis 12, one through three. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, your father's house and go to the land. I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And we've said in the last two weeks, it was always God's intention for all people on earth to be blessed. God always wanted all people on earth to be blessed. But what stops the blessing? Sin. Sin produces the curse. When there is sin, there is curse. And so God wanted all peoples on earth to be blessed. But Adam lost the blessing through Adam. The blessing could have gone to all people on earth, but he lost it. And so now God is making a way. And we've mentioned before, and we'll get to it again, that God's intent is that through Abram, all people on earth will be blessed and we already have, and we'll go back again to the New Testament scriptures in Galatians that show how all people on earth can be blessed through Abram. Now we're going to get back to that point later, but then we see the blessing was spoken or promised by God to Abram in Genesis 12. We see in Genesis 13, great wealth came to Abram. And as we've said before, it is supernatural. It is not natural ability to multiply and increase. It is beyond what's natural. It is, it is beyond what man can do himself because that's what the anointing is. The anointing is power to do what you cannot do in natural ability. It's where God's supernatural ability comes on human beings on people to do what natural ability cannot do. It takes you beyond natural ability and gets you into God's supernatural ability. So the blessing is supernatural power and ability to get wealthy and be great, both numerically and financially to multiply numerically and financially. Then in Genesis 14, we see in verse 18, Genesis 14, 18, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. And he blessed Abram saying, blessed be Abram by God most high creator of heaven and earth and blessed be God most high who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a 10th of everything. And we've been talking about these verses for the last few days and notice again, how closely that sounds the blessing that Melchizedek spoke to Abram, how similar it sounds to the blessing Noah spoke to Shem. Noah said to Shem in Genesis 9, 26, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. Now that was actually blessing Shem. Shem was blessed in that statement. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. In other words, Shem is the one chosen to be blessed by the Lord and for the Lord to be the God of Shem. In other words, for Shem to carry up, to take up and carry the covenant and blessing, the God of Shem. You see, it's just like the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. It's a covenant relationship. Just like the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob identify covenant relationship between God and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. We see here the God of Shem, the God of Shem. What does that mean? Covenant relationship. Shem was going to be in covenant with God. God would have his covenant with Shem. 
and therefore Shem would be blessed with the covenant. Notice again and again and again, covenant and blessing, they are hand in hand, always in scripture, the covenant and the blessing, they go hand in hand. You get the covenant. What do you get? You get the blessing. And so we see that Shem was the one of three sons of Noah to be given the covenant and the blessing by Noah to Shem, the God of Shem covenant relationship, the God of Shem showing that God was in covenant with Shem. And the next person you see with the title, the God of was Abraham, the God of Abraham the God of Abraham, and then the God of Isaac, and then the God of Jacob. And notice how similar they are. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. And when Melchizedek spoke to Abram, blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high. Now, yesterday at the close of the program, I made a statement, which I had said also last week, that in the oral tradition of the Jews, Melchizedek is Shem. Shem was Melchizedek. Now, again, let me review. If you missed those programs, we do not take the oral tradition as scripture. For us, it was not canonized. However, there is a lot of truth in it. And the oral tradition is what was spoken by Moses to Israel that did not get written down. When we read the books of Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, particularly Leviticus and Deuteronomy, we see the law that was written down. But Moses said actually a lot more. Moses said a lot more than what was written. And so what was spoken by Moses and not written is what became for the Jews the oral tradition. Now, later when they, the Jews were going to be scattered among the nations, they were being taken into captivity. The Jewish scribes and leaders did write down the oral tradition so that it would not be lost. Otherwise, if when they were scattered, it could have been lost for generations to come. So they did write it down and it's written down today. And in that oral tradition, it is, it is said by Moses that Shem is Melchizedek. Melchizedek is Shem. And that is very possible, even probable, very probable. Because, um, let me share it with you several things. For one thing, when Moses was on Mount Sinai, he was in the presence of God on the top of Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights. He was actually what we would call caught up in the spirit, caught up in the spirit. And he saw heaven. Now, whether he physically went to heaven or just saw it in a vision, we don't know. Just like Paul said in Corinthians, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. But he, I was, you know, a man was caught up to the third heaven. Paul testifies, well, whether he was in the body or out of the body doesn't really matter whether he went or whether he just saw it in vision form doesn't really matter. But Moses saw heaven and he saw the heavenly tabernacle. And that's how he had a visual picture for the earthly tabernacle. He was supposed to write down the dimensions for the tabernacle and the size and materials and everything for how the tabernacle should be built. But he also saw the heavenly uh, tabernacle, which was the pattern. And that's told us in Hebrews that the heavenly tabernacle was the pattern for the earthly. So he saw it. So he had a picture image to follow as well as the written dimensions. Well, when he saw that, it's also uh, recorded that in the oral tradition that he saw other things in heaven. For example, he saw warehouses. Even today, Christians have seen warehouses in heaven Th- that he saw the blessings stored up in heaven. And so 
it is not unreasonable or unlikely to think that Moses could also have seen Melchizedek and recognized and been told that Melchizedek was Shem because that is very likely as God was revealing to Moses. Let's look at it like this. Moses was the man in the old Testament who got divine revelation of heavenly things in a way he's parallel to Paul in the new Testament. Paul in the new Testament was also caught up to the third heaven and had revelations of divine mysteries and of heavenly things. That's why also um, many scholars believe, and I agree, I believe that Hebrews, the book of Hebrews was written by Paul. He was given divine revelations. He was given secrets uh, and mysteries of God and heavenly things and the ways of God. Well, Moses is Paul's parallel in the Old Testament. Moses was, you could say, very much like Paul, being caught up to heaven, seeing heavenly things, seeing the heavenly tabernacle, seeing the blessings stored up in heaven. He was Paul's counterpart in the Old Covenant to see the divine mysteries of God in vision and being caught up, whether in the body or out of the body, we don't know, but he did see it just like Paul saw it. And so you could really see that Moses and Paul were very much alike. And so the tradition, oral tradition was written down of also the things that Moses saw when he was caught up in God's presence on Mount Sinai. And it is written that he saw and wrote and said that Shem is Melchizedek. Well, he could have seen Melchizedek and seen God say, this is Shem. And that is very possible. And as I'll get to in a minute, Shem was still alive when Abraham was alive. Shem was still alive when Abraham was still alive. But let me jump back to something in Hebrews 7. As we're talking about this, to me, this has become just God opening up more revelation on the subject of blessing. I've taught the blessing for years and years and years. But every time I teach something, the Lord adds more insight, more revelation, more opening of the scripture. And I've seen more this time, particularly regarding Shem. But I want to answer something. I am not ignoring Hebrews 7, 3. And some of you listening and who have listened the last few days, as I've said, Shem could have been Melchizedek. I'm not saying for a fact, but I believe very probably Shem was Melchizedek. And some of you listening, you might know your scriptures well enough to know Hebrews 7, 3. And you might say, how could Shem be Melchizedek when you read Hebrews 7, 3? Well, let me read to you Hebrews 7, 3. And it looks like there could be a contradiction, but I'm going to show you where it does not really make a contradiction. Hebrews 7, 3. Without, well, let me back up to verse 1. Let's read it in context. Verse 1, Hebrews 7, 1 through 3. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth or tithe of everything. First, his name means king of righteousness. Then also, king of Salem means king of peace. Verse 3. Now, this is the scripture that some of you might have been thinking. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, 
like the son of God, he remains a priest forever. Let me read it again. Verse three, without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life. Like the son of God, he remains a priest forever. So at a surface glance, that looks like you could say, how could Shem be Melchizedek? If it says without father or mother and genealogy, because we know Shem's father was Noah. How could this be Melchizedek? Let me show you. This is what, you know, I asked the Lord the same thing. I don't want to present something to you that I haven't asked the Lord about. And I'm not going to ignore scriptures in order to make a point. And so if Shem is Melchizedek, then there has to be an answer for Hebrews 7, 3. And this is what the Lord, I believe, showed me. And that is that um, in a study Bible, I've got a study Bible and there's notes written about Melchizedek being a type of Christ, a type, meaning a picture, a um, a likeness, the, the type and shadow, meaning the the similar picture of Christ. Melchizedek was a type of Christ as high priest, because number one, he was a man. He was a man. Now, Melchizedek could not be a type of Christ if he wasn't a man. If he wasn't a man, he couldn't be an accurate picture type of Christ because Christ was also a man, the man Christ Jesus. So because Melchizedek was a type of Christ, because number one, he was a man. Well, if he was a man and not just a spirit image or a manifestation of an angel, he wasn't an angel because if Melchizedek was an angel, an angel is never a priest in scripture. Melchizedek could not have been an angel because in scripture, there's never an angel as a priest on in the scriptures that we see. And it certainly could not be an angel is a type of Christ. So he could not be an angel. And could he have been perhaps just an appearance of God? Well, yes, he could have, but then he wouldn't also have been an accurate type of Christ because Christ was a man. In the flesh, born of a woman, he was made flesh. And so therefore, the type of Christ needed to be flesh and needed to be a man. So with that, also um, back to uh, where I'm, I'm reading in the study of Melchizedek, Melchizedek was a suitable type of Christ as high priest because number one, he was a man. Number two, he was a king priest, king priest. Well, we are also now called king priests. And so we see he, he was a man. So how could Hebrews 7, 3 be correct if Melchizedek is Shem? Let, and this is what the Lord showed me. Melchizedek had to be a man in order to be an accurate type of Christ as king priest. However, Melchizedek was not revealed to Abram as probably Abram did not know even possibly Abram did not know who Melchizedek was, except he appeared to bring the covenant and the blessing. Now, without father or mother, what is that? It's Melchizedek. We never see the name Melchizedek before or after Genesis chapter 14. We never see the name Melchizedek 
before or after Genesis 14. The name Melchizedek, only the appearance, let me say, of Melchizedek is only once in history. Uh, Melchizedek is only recorded to have appeared once in history. And that was in Genesis 14. So as Melchizedek, Melchizedek does not have father or mother or genealogy because his appearance was once. And it doesn't show where Melchizedek came from or Melchiz- where Melchizedek went after he blessed Abram. But as Shem, the man, that would be different. Yes, we know Shem, the man, had a father, Noah, and had genealogy. So anyway, that's what the Lord showed me regarding Hebrews 7, 3, without father or mother or genealogy. Melchizedek, the name and the, and the, uh, the appearance of Melchizedek king priest is only once with no recorded uh, where he came from before that or where he went after that. You never saw him before that. You never saw him again after that. That's why Hebrews 7, 3 says he's uh, without father or mother. But that does not mean he could not be Shem. Well, we're going to pick us up right here again tomorrow. And remember, God loves you. You're blessed and highly favored by the Lord.